Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jana. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for all your congratulations, comments on my last video when I posted about my graduation from my nursing degree. That was so, so nice of you. Thank you so much. Um, you guys are so supportive and I really, really like it. In today's video, I want to go back again to the nursing topic. So I want to share with you my experience of doing one month in ED which is emergency so what happened is for those of you who haven't seen my last videos <clears throat> i had my internship uh, so i've been doing my bachelor of nursing science this was my last year i literally finished like a week ago and in the end of my last semester in the end of my like complete degree i had internship internship was in my uni for eight months sorry it was for eight weeks and my first month was in an emergency okay it was a public hospital emergency and i wanted to share with you what i've been doing there as rn student and how did it go for us in terms of like the last last placement what was the load patient load and things like that uh, so my emergency department had four actually five sections so we had triage then so we had a waiting room for all the patients to come in and wait as many of you probably have seen in emergencies when you go there like by yourself as a patient then when you go in so you have your triage you have your resuscitation area then you will have your acute areas inside so as students as RN students we were not practicing in triage or resuscitation unit we were only practicing in acute areas so in a hospital where i was they had two acute areas they were divided by color it was a green color and red color this is where most of your patients would go with conditions like chest pain a hyperglycemia uh, after falls if it's someone elderly closed fractures if they have any then you will have conditions like uh abde pain viral symptoms um you might have bleeding in the urine as well mental conditions also overdosing and also attempts of suicide as as sad as it sounds but you will have patients like this as well so these patients will go into these two acute areas and then the third area of sort of like these three areas because they're beside each other will be your short stay area so this is basically when patients who've been in these first two acute areas and most of the assessments and tests been done there and they sort of not sort of but they are more or less stable they can be transferred into short stay area and wait for the final results this could be results from x-ray or any other imaging or scanning this could be the last uh, blood test uh, for troponin levels for example if the ECG was performed before or UA um, results and things like that so they stay there they still being monitored by RNs you know and still the OBS will be taken uh, meals can be offered to them there you know and all of that and the nurses will be checking constantly for the results to come back to see them and also doctors then will come and talk to the patient so this is like um, in a nutshell quickly a quick explanation so in ed there are no ens well in the hospital that i was practicing in there are no ens okay only rns and then you will have wardies and you will have aans who would come and do like a light duties okay you won't be given showers to the patients in ed very rarely you would be changing pads it can happen mostly like or the continent aids with elderly people okay who might be incontinent you know and depending what condition they will present it with but generally your cares would be mainly concentrating on assessing doing different type of assessments and just assisting if you need to take person to the toilet and things like that you will have a lot of doctors there you will have fully qualified doctors and you will have those ones who are studying and practicing or in other words you will call them resident doctors okay so um as a rn nurse in ed or as a RN student, let's talk about RN students because this is from the 
perspective of an RN student when you do your practice, you will be in a close contact with doctors and you will need to practice that and your, your facilitator would, would want you to practice that because this is your final placement and after that you will be outside in the world as RN by yourself. So you need to know how to communicate effectively and more confidently with the doctors and also other health practitioners there as well. So you will be in a close contact. Doctor will be telling you, for example, if they want you to take a sample for UI testing from your patients, they will be telling you whether you, they want ECG to be done or the blood tests to be sent and also they will let you know if the person is going for any imaging so what will happen when the person will be arrived to ED you will have a handover from the person from another nurse who are assisting transfer of that patient so either they will be coming from triaging or maybe from resuscitation if they were very acute there but then stabilized and they will be moved to these acute areas in um, uh, acute department in ED. So you will have a handover about that patient. Then as a nurse or as an RN student, you will need to do your admission paperwork. Then you will need to do your base ops, uh, lion ops as well. So you will need to check the blood pressure, the heart rate, the oxygen level. You will need to do a pain assessment on the person as well. Uh, check the skin and also offer the person to put on a hospital gown okay and lay down in bed depending on the acute acuity of the situation um, you might need to start acting really quickly and doing assessments and cares in an efficient way as well like for example one of the patients that i had it was a young person um, that person came with a hyperglycemia because they were managing really poorly their diabetes so we needed to do the ivs and all of that and watch that person really closely and act really quickly of course as a nurse you're not going to be acting on your own you will be following directions of the doctor and also you will be doing your scope of practice things that you can do in your scope of practice as rn and the doctor will be giving you directions as well so um, the most common assessments that you will be performing as RN will be collecting urine for UI testing. So the form will need to be signed by the doctor. So we'll, he will give you an order to do it and he will sign the form for you. Then you will assist your patient to go to the toilet and ask them to collect a urine sample, a midstream, and then you will send it to pathology. Then the second assessment, the most common, would be your bloods. So for the bloods, you will be performing, I'll tell you which type of bloods, I have written them down here. So you will, will be performing full blood count, full blood count, your CAM20, which is your electrolytes, your liver function, your kidney function, EGFR, you will be studying this at either uni if you're doing your Bachelor of Nursing Science or Diploma of General Nursing. So you will need to see how your kidney is functioning. Then also coagulants just to see the blood clotting as well if anyone is on a blood thinners. Then you will perform your blood gas if needed, okay? And they have a machine for it, so it's really easy to get the results. You basically collect the blood and then <clears throat> you go to the machine and you put it in there and the results come really quickly. So you can see the hemoglobin level there, your lactate level to see if the person has any infection in their bodies, if they had epilepsy, epilepsy for example, any seizures, uh, if they are hydrated as well, or even if someone was overusing <clears throat> opioids like fentanyl. Okay, and then you will be also checking for troponin for those one who come with the chest pain. But again, 
Sometimes bloods can be initiated by the nurse, as I understood it from my practice there, but also the doctors will be asking you to do that as well. If someone comes with the chest pain, so you will be performing ECGs, you will be testing for troponin, and usually there is a two types, uh, there is a two times of ECG testing. So you do the you do the first one ECG, and you will do and you will send the bloods for troponin, and then you will need to do the second one as well. Um, what I understood as well from my practice is that the doctors like to do two ECGs. So when the results come and then do another ECG as well. The person might be already in a short stay area, <clears throat> moved from acute to short stay and you can perform another ECG there. So as an RN student, it's a really, really good opportunity for you to practice a lot of ECGs because you will need, you will be doing them a lot, really. You will have a lot of chest pain cases coming through and you will be practicing a lot of ECGs. So you will learn how to put the leads on, where they go exactly in a body. You will try to learn and distinguish between abnormal heart rhythms and normal ones. And then also what they like there, once you perform an ECG and you send it to print, make sure to give it to the doctor within the next 10 minutes. Do not delay. Ask patient if they have any chest pain at the moment of checking and write it down on an ECG print if they have any chest pain and give it to the doctor so they could check it. Okay, so that's for that. Also, when you do any bloods and it comes back in a computer, so they use a specific system there on a computer and you can actually trace as a nurse um, the blood results of your patient. Also, you can chase there on a computer any notes being done by the doctors, by pharmacists, by physios as well. You can see what's going on, whether the patient is for discharge, for example, you know, especially the doctors will put notes when they receive the blood tests and imaging tests and all of that all of those results and then they will put their notes so you as a nurse you need to be constantly always checking to know what's happening with your patient also when your patient come and you do all your assessments and things like that uh, from the nursing perspective and scope of practice the doctors all also go in and talk to the patients. So they will ask them their history, you know, what happened, you know, why are they presented here? They will ask their symptoms. They will examine them physically as well as verbally by asking questions, ass assess their pain level and things like that. Then they will, they might prescribe them PRN opioids, just the pain reliefs as well. If they have nausea, they can give them medication for that if they are diabetic they will prescribe something for their diabetes something that they've been regularly taking it at home you never know how long you can stay in the emergency you can stay from few hours to almost a day or even day and a half they try to discharge patients and move them to appropriate areas as fast as they can because the turnover in emergency is very high you have all the time people coming and i would say that the pm shift is the most uh, busiest one than the morning shifts so um, yeah so the doctors doctors will do a lot of assessments as well and sometimes you will find you as a nurse and a doctor doing the same assessments but that's okay because you need to know from your side and they need to know from their side so so that's for that um, what else um, also remember that in ED, this is the same as any other area. If you do any pinching medications, so those will would involve your opioids, your antibiotics, your anticoagulants, your heparin, your clexane, and all of that, even furosemide and all of that. All these medications, antipsychotic, you will need to check it with the second nurse. Okay, so this will be applicable anywhere you go. You will need to your second nurse to be um, checking it um, in a drug room if you're preparing it there and taking it out from the cupboard and also near to the bedside table. Okay, so just remember that all the time. You as a student will do uh, quite a few subcut anticoagulant injections. So that would be your clexane, heparin, some stuff like that. Um, also, 
when you do the blood test when the results come something that i forgot to mention uh, for hemoglobin for example for lactate you know and any like potassium your calcium on all other electrolytes you will actually will have the normal ranges stated in brackets so you will have the result for for example for hemoglobin coming for that particular patient and then in brackets you will have the normal ranges so you don't have to really remember them by heart because uh, if you are a new RN, for example, it's hard for you to remember them right away. But if you've been practicing in ED for years, you will all you will you will already know your normal ranges. But also the system highlights the numbers, the results for particular, let's say, electrolyte in an orange or red color if it's higher than the normal range or it shows an error up. If it's below the normal range, let's say if someone is low in potassium, which is not really good for your heart, then it will be either blue or green color and the error will be showing down. But also you will have in brackets your numbers so you could know what are the normal numbers because with more practice it will stay in your head what else so your patients will be sent to uh, scans so this could include your x-rays which is the simplest ones and then um, mris and also ct scans you might have as i mentioned before patients coming with closed fractures and you might not know that they have a fracture because let's say if it's a little old Doris she came after a fall because she lives alone and nobody watching her and she was cooking a breakfast and fell down you know face the floor you don't know whether she has any fractures you know so they will come to the emergency and then from us sent to imaging which sorry I thought that my camera turned off and then sent to imaging uh, which is in the same hospital where I was practicing so we had imaging and all type of scans in the same hospital just a different level and then come back to us as well um, you as a nurse sometimes will be um, assisting the transfer you can actually go uh, and escort the patient together with the wardy and sometimes you will stay on the floor and the wardy will do it themselves um, so the ratio in ED is as far as i remember i think it's two nurses per eight patients or per seven something like that yeah, or even three i think it's two per six something like that i wouldn't remember now exactly you as a rn student you will be encouraged to take from two to three patients on your own of course you will be still assisted by the nurse you will be still assisted and provided help and education and you know answering all your questions and guidance and all of that but try to take initiative you know communicate to the doctors you know when you're doing UIs or bloods make sure that all the forms are signed by the doctors because you have to send it to pathology having the form as well as the sample so um also when the doctor will be communicating to you about assessments that they do with the patients you know and what's the next step and things like that or they want to for example uh ask you questions you know how the last set of obs was you know did they have any pain how is the pain going now you know did pr and medication help and things like that so try as rn to communicate with doctors as much as you can i'll tell you that the doctors there most of the doctors they're especially residents they are young in age they're super friendly super open-minded and they all work there as a team there is nothing there feels like doctors are somewhere up there and you as a nurse down there they all work at the same level as a beautiful team very respectful to each other and don't be afraid to maybe not know something as a student or ask a stupid feeling stupid question because there are no stupid questions at all okay nobody gonna judge you there really because as i said they are super friendly like super friendly i even was talking to some of the doctors they're asking about uh, medical school that they study you know how hard it is how long it is what they do how they choose the profession which area they want to practice in after that like i was asking them and just having chats and i mean like they're so nice, cool people. 
Okay, so that was about these. Um, you will do also, uh, along with the subcuts, of course, you will give a lot of oral medication. Also, you will practice a lot of IVs that could include opioids, that could include um, your antibiotics, even potassiums, glucose for someone who comes, you know, with uh, poor um, diabetes management. Uh, or insulin if it's hypo uh, sorry hyperglycemia then you will practice bolus um opioids as well you can be given fentanyl through uh iv push um so you will learn how to mix all of that in a drug room remember to use the yellow injectable drug book for mixing your medication because this will help you do not just rely on the nurse on your body nurse all also double check unless you are like in very acute acute situation and you have to do really something really quickly you know then there is exception just you can rely on your nurse but you as a student always try to stay safe and use appropriate materials to just make sure that you're doing the right thing uh, what else? Um, so you will need to provide comfort to the patients while they're waiting for their um, results of the tests as well, whether it's the imaging bloods or UIs or review of the doctor, whatever. If they have any questions, you know, you can educate them if they need assistance assistance going to toilet you can provide there remember there are no ENs on the floor only RNs okay so you will be the one providing assistance to your patients um, some of them will be on hourly orbs some will be half an hourly depending if they have um, bloods running for example or potassium you know or opioids or whatever so you need to be looking at checking the respiratory rates and respiratory status of the patient and things like that doing pain, pain assessment frequently then you will need still to check your bgls as well they do have meals there in ed also they have fridge where for patients where you can access um, sandwiches custard yogurt juices you can make tea and coffee for them as well so all of that is provided um, what else cannulation so most of the rns there in ed would know how to cannulate and this is a very simple course that you even as a grad RN student can do it or not a grad RN student you would be grad RN because you would be finished already with your bachelor and if you are in a grad program for example during that year you can do this course so you could cannulate the patients because you will need to do a lot of cannulation for the purpose of doing blood testing okay sometimes they would come from recess or triage already having a cannula or they might have a cannula if they if they've been um transported to the hospital by the emergency by the ambulance i mean so if they came by the ambulance sometimes paramedics in ambulance can actually cannulate them and then your handover will be given to you by the paramedics actually remember it remembering it now you will have a lot of patients being given to you by the paramedics so you will receive a handover from the paramedic and it will be a lot of paramedic students practicing to give a handover to you as an RN student as well which was really cool I found it really cool because um, they practiced to give and I was practicing to receive and we were both students you know so that's that's really awesome um, yeah, so it will be a lot of cannulating. You as an RN student cannot do a cannulation because as I said, it has to be a course. As a, as a student, you're not going to be doing this course. It's not part of your bachelor or diploma. It's, uh, sorry, as an EN, probably you won't be practicing this in ED. Or maybe some hospitals have ENs. I'm not sure. Just this hospital that I went to didn't have any ENs in ED. But yeah. Cannulation is not part of Diploma of Enroll Nursing or Bachelor of Nursing Science, okay? Um, this is in-hospital uh, training provided and you can do it when you work as RN. Uh, so that's for cannulation. Um, I think that was it pretty much. Uh, you won't be doing a lot of like... 
uh, difficult assessments, you know, you can still auscultate your patient, you can listen to their chest, you can palpate if someone comes with um, after pain, so you can palpate the area and just ask where does it hurt, what type of pain it is, when does it start, where does it radiate, you know, and things like that. So you can do this assessment, you can listen to the chest. Here, my cam camera turned off. So you can listen to the chest of your patient. Um, you can listen to the front here and to the back. So do you know how to listen? You go up corner to the left, then at the bottom under your shoulder blade, then to the right corner up, and then at the bottom you listen there, and then you listen here, 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 and here. Okay, there is a way how to do uh, auscultation. You can, uh, you will learn this in your diploma and in bachelor, and also you can YouTube it as well, or even Google it. There are lots of information online where you can learn, and also you can listen to the sound, like a wheezing sound, like a boiling water sound. You know, wheezing would be for someone who have like um, asthma, COPD, someone who's been smoking for a long time, boiling sort of like a crackling water sound. That could indicate if someone has a pneumonia or fluid accumulated somewhere in lungs and you can actually listen even hear it where also you might be listening to someone who has an abdu pain who's been not opening bowels for a long time for the bowel sounds so practice that one as well see if there are any sounds you can hear in the abdomen area and if there is an absence of sound as well so this will help you and give a little bit of indication if someone has an obstruction for example if there are not any sounds at all but of course the doctor will, the doctors will go in do the same assessment as well and then either send someone for imaging for scanning you know or um, do other sorts of assessments so you will be practicing those ones as well i'm just trying to remember if i've done any other things there so i was as a student practicing from monday to friday only and thanks god they were not rotating us in the same week for a.m.s and p.m. shifts so we were having one week only mornings I think it starts from 6.30 till 3.30, something like that. Don't remember now exactly, or 7 till 3.30. And then your afternoon shifts, they were, I think, from 2.30 till 11. Okay, and we had one week of a.m. shifts, one week of p.m. shifts, and then again a.m. and then p.m. No weekends were involved into ED practice, so I stayed there for one month. I was pretty ha happy. We had our facilitator always on the floor with us. They would come at least once or twice a shift. Really polite people would assess you, ask you, you know, guide you, you know, making sure that you are doing all right, making sure that your body nurse is communicating with you and treating you in professional way. Um, yeah, like all my body nurse has been really great. I was bodied with really good people, so I really, really liked it. Um, also regarding your uh, patients that come with the mental uh, conditions, you know, it could be depression, anxiety and all of that. So you will have other specialists involved in there in the care as well. Sometimes they might be moved to a special mental health care facility or a mental health, health department in a different hospital for more assessment and more cares in there. Um, so it's a good experience for you as well, how to deal with this type of people. For example, I've never been sent to a placement in a mental health care facility, but I've been witnessing my uh, patients who had some mental disorders in ED. I had adults and I had kids as well. It's very frustrating to observe them as a student, you might not necessarily go and do a lot of assessments or cares to these patients because it's very hard to approach them. Sometimes you might even call a security to just, to, to just keep them safe from themselves uh, because they wouldn't take uh, medication that would help them to calm. Um, so for safety reason, as a student, your facilitator or your body RN nurse might ask you to just stay on the side and just watch and learn, um, just to keep you safe. 
but yeah it's still a good experience just observe other nurses and doctors how they deal with this type of patients they are not easy to deal with but at the same time when you go in the free world as a qualified RN or EN you will need to do this on your own of course you will have assistance from other nurses and security if something is dangerous to you as a healthcare professional but you also need to learn how to assist them in a polite kind and professional way that is still safe for you and safe for them but if the situation escalates to aggression for example or something that presents danger to you as a healthcare professional there are always security bodies on the floor who can come and um, interfere and um, yeah just keep everyone safe so that's for that um yeah, I already mentioned that the afternoon shifts are more busier. I think like people do more naughty stuff, <laughs> making them to present into the emergency, like falls and all of that. Um, the morning shift, I think like sometimes up until 10 or 11, it will be really quiet. You will have only a few patients, you know, and then like from lunchtime, it starts to become really busy. And then towards the afternoon shift, your PM shift, your late shift, you will have lots of patients coming in, you know, and uh, yeah. But in general, it was a really good experience. You know, I really enjoyed it. I never went to emergency placement before. I've been always pretty much in my different surgical areas and perioperative areas, but this was my first emergency experience and when i knew that i was going to emergency for the whole month oh my god i was so so happy because this was something completely new something that i was dreaming of trying because the more areas i try the more i thought i would understand where my heart is leaning to where i want to work what i have interest to and you never know until you try so when i knew that i was going to do emergency i was like yes 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 because so many of my fellow students went to do emergencies like in the second year i had fellow students when i was doing my diploma of enroll nursing who went to to do placement in emergency it's like why i am not going why i'm not going i want to go too like i have a genuine desire to go and do it and i was not giving placement there you know i had a lot of surgicals which i liked as well i had a lot of experience in different surgical world so when i had this placement i was like yes finally at least i got it in the end in my internship you know better later than never at all so i really really like it so it was a really good experience for me anyways i think this is all what i wanted to mention um yeah i think this is all oh, oh also just remember that um even in emergency you will still have elderly people who might have difficulty swallowing you know or eating so just if you see that you're giving to someone let's say someone is really elderly and you're giving them oral tablets you know if they don't have dementia ask them how do you take your tablets at home do you need them to be broken down you know um do you have your tablets let's say taken with custard you know and if there are any family members of an elderly patient like their children or whatever ask them as well if their mom or dad are on any thickened fluids you know or are they taking free fluids or thin fluids or is it thickened you know are they on any type of diet do they have any allergies as well also make sure to ask your patients for allergies because you don't want to give something that they would have a reaction to and then on top of the presenting condition you also have to deal with the allergy symptoms as well so uh, ED would be like any other department in terms of safety to the patient so always ask these things and if you see someone is choking like for example if it's an elderly patient and there are no family members involved or someone came from the HK facility you know and you've given them water to drink you know with their medication and they start to choke just think about it maybe they are on thickened fluids in their HK facility maybe they can't just drink a thin water because it just goes into their airways so you can go to the fridge and you can have like a level one level two thickened fluids and give you medication or just put it in a custard you know so simple things like this always try to think broadly 
not only as a healthcare professional but also a person who would genuinely care about someone else you know and just turn on and practice your common sense you know what I'm what I mean um, yeah it will come to you with practice really the more you practice the more broadly you will start to think and things will come easily to your mind as well so yeah I think this is all what I wanted to share in this video I hope it, won it wasn't too boring for you guys I hope it was still useful and in my next video I want to cover my second block of placement which was in perioperative area which included a few small areas inside I will talk about it in my next video and I will tell you what I was doing there because second block was the same exciting and interesting as my first one in emergency till then I'll see you in my next videos bye